All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Barber. Obviously, we are uh, in Chapter 11. This chapter is a uh, single case, quasi-experimental and developmental research. And so we're going to talk about quasi-experimental. We're going to compare that to um, experimental research, true experiment, and the differences between the two. And we're talking about different designs that we use and can use uh, to, again, get and make inferences about population based on uh, the populations that we study. So oftentimes when we talk about a uh, true experiment, true experiment um, is essentially using random assignment to uh, divide or place uh, individuals to different groups, right? Either to a control group or into a treatment group. But with quasi-experimental uh, research, uh, you don't have the opportunity practically to do a, you know, a random, random assignment. So you, uh, you choose who's in a control group and who's in an experimental group, and then you do the study. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about a few of the designs uh, that are used, and then we'll, we'll we'll get out of here. Okay. All right. Let me share my screen, share the slides, and then we'll move forward. Okay. All right. So again, we're in chapter 11, single case, quasi-experimental and developmental research. And we'll talk about um, how we use those different types of research to answer our research question. Okay. Uh, here we have, uh, here are our objectives. Um, we'll talk about, there are six objectives. So we'll talk about, you know, the single case experimental design uh, we're kind of similar to what we call a, a, it's not a case study, but we're using one person um, to uh, an individual, uh, indiv independent variable and the dependent variable, and we are measuring that on one single person. Um, and what we'll talk about, um, you can replicate that with other people to see if there is a an effect that's happening when you are, uh, again, changing the independent variable uh, and then measuring that dependent variable. We'll talk about, uh, you know, one group post only post-test design. So we'll talk about several different uh, variations of designs, experimental designs, and uh, quasi-experimental designs and how they work. I'll go through a few examples. Uh, there are a few charts that gives you a better uh, visual representation of what those look like and what the uh, what the data may look like with a few of these designs. And again, we'll talk about um, towards the end uh, how all of this ties together, okay? Uh, so seven objectives. Uh, so we'll talk about cohort effect at the end, um, especially when we talk about cross-sectional um, data. Um, and, uh, and so we'll talk about those types of things. All right, so the single case experiment of the design. Um, single case experiment designs, they are solely one person, right? So we have one person or a small number of research participants who are going through a research experiment. Okay, this allows you um, to, to determine a cause and effect, right? But again, it's based on one or a small number of research participants. The downside to a single case experiment is you're using a small group, so you may not be able to uh, generalize this to an entire population. Um, if I took and selected one individual out of our class to participate in an experiment, that one individual is extremely unique. And so without uh, again, doing this and replicating it with everyone in the classroom, I could not generalize the results that I get for that one participant to the entire class unless I included a larger sample size, right? So again, uh, the single case experimental design is also called the single subject design or small end design, small end meaning small sample size. And with smaller sample sizes, it makes it a lot easier or a lot harder, more difficult for me to generalize to a population, okay? The subject's behavior is measured at a baseline period, right? So say I'm, I'm trying to do an experiment on uh, smoking and I want to reduce uh, the cessation for individuals uh, in my community. So I take one participant, uh, maybe he's a heavy smoker, I put him through a, uh, a two-week intervention program, okay? I measure them at baseline, how many packs of, how many packs of cigarettes are you smoking a day, right? I take him through that um, two-week intervention, and then I give him a post-test 
to see if there was any difference in the pre-test and the post-test to see if that, that intervention had any, had any effect, right? So again, with an single case experiment, you're really just trying to determine what happens when you manipulate that independent variable. And if that independent variable has an effect, then you'll be able to see it um, from the baseline, right? And then after the baseline has been uh, manipulated with that independent variable, okay? So then we have reversal design. Right? You can do a reversal design with a single case study. Oftentimes, this is done where you introduce an intervention or a treatment. Again, you take the baseline initially, then you introduce the treatment, and then you remove the treatment and see if the baseline or the second baseline, if it returns to the, the, the original level or if it remains kind of lower than the original. What you, what you hope to see is, especially with something like smoking, you would hope, okay, a baseline, they're smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. That's, you know, pretty intense. But if you do the treatment for two weeks, you see over the course of those two weeks, they reduce their amount of uh, smoking and the packs of cigarettes they smoke. And then when you remove them from that treatment, then you may see an uptick or an increase in the level of, or number of cigarettes they smoke, but it may not be at that same same level, right? So what you're wanting to see is when you're talking about reversal designs, at the baseline, you introduce the treatment, and then once you remove the treatment, what happens? So you're trying to see if there's any effect in the intervention that you introduce. And if there is, you should see a, a reduction. Okay, you see it at baseline, you see, you know, pretty high level of, of, of the behavior. At the intervention, you're trying to reduce the behavior. And then once you remove the intervention, it may uh, increase the behavior again because the intervention is no longer there, that treatment has been removed. And so you're able to see an effect um, in uh, in, the, in those cases, okay? With this, right, you are trying to kind of improve, right? And so you can improve this to see if there is an actual change or impact or effect happening, right? So if the original reversal of A, B, A, so A is baseline, B is treatment, and then A is a second baseline, you can see and, ex and extend upon this and improve your study by adding additional treatments and baselines, right? So you can have an A, B, A, B, right? So that means that the treatment is the last, uh, the last part of the experiment, or you can have a, even go three iterations, A, B, A, B, A, B, right? So again, that the B is that treatment that you end off on the treatment. When you have something, and we'll talk about this ethically, you have something that's really beneficial for your participants, you want to probably end off on, on a good note by ending on the treatment so that you're not, um, again, withdrawing them with, uh, without, having, um, in, without having treatment, right? So you want to keep that treatment there, end it on the treatment, and see how well, how they, how well they maintain the behavior. Okay. Okay, so the benefits of extending, right? It, it addresses two very distinct problems, right? With the ABA reversal design. When you just have a single reversal, right? Just A, B, A. It's not extremely powerful because there are other factors that may influence uh, the reversal, right? And the behavior, right? It's not always ethical, like I talked about before, to end the treatment that may be very beneficial for the participant. So when you end a treatment, the sequence ends with the treatment, rather than the withdrawal of the treatment. And so you want to end on a really positive note, especially if that treatment is very beneficial for your participant that you're serving, right? So in that smoking example, I know that it's reducing the, the number of cigarettes they smoke a day or packs of cigarettes they smoke a day. I would want to end on the treatment, right? End them in that two week period so that I, I make sure that they are ending on a, a very, very powerful note, okay? But again, that's the, the benefit of extending is that you get an opportunity to see, you know, that the treatment is ending on, um, again, on a good note. Okay, so here's an example of a reversal design. And this is coming from uh, one, of the, one of the books and out of the book. So it says, a study was evaluated the effects of prompts and incentives on designated drivers in a bar, okay? They define the dependent variable as the percentage of customers either functioning as or riding with a designated driver. 
they used a ABCA design to evaluate the effectiveness of prompts and incentives on dependent variable. So the C is that control, right? So you have a uh, A baseline, B um, treatment, and then that C is kind of the, that, the control period, and then you have a, a second baseline period, okay? So the, they recorded the DV or the dependent variable over a baseline over a period of two weeks, right? So the treatment phase included a procedure where designated drivers received a gas car and the driver and the passengers received free pizza on their way out of the bar, right? So what they're trying to do is reduce the number of individuals who are driving under the influence. That's, that's, the, that's the, the idea of this entire study, right? So they give them pizza and a gas incentive and they discontinue during the final phase of the study. Right? So they remove that treatment during the final phase of the study. So during that, again, you had a baseline period of two weeks, right? Then you had a treatment and then you had another baseline, okay? The results indicated that when they introduced that intervention, they were successful at increasing the ratio of safe to unsafe passengers in the bar, right? So they were reducing the number of individuals who got in the car under the influence, right? So even if they had a designated driver, they did not drive on their own, or they, they got a ride, maybe an Uber or ride share in order to get home safely, right? So they were increasing the ratio of safe to unsafe or reducing the number of individuals uh, when we talk about unsafe passengers as well, right? So they looked at introducing that treatment, that $5 gas card and pizza, just incentivizing them to, again, travel safely home, or when they removed it, they saw that the, the, the the number of passengers, unsafe passengers, began to increase again. So what they would probably want to do is do a, an extension of that and end on the incentive. So that, you know, $5 gas card pizza in order to keep that number, number low. Okay. So here is, here is an example of, uh, you know, a, a reversal design, right? ABA research design. So you have number on the, on the uh, Y axis, you have number of correct homework problems. So say that this is a, and on the X axis, you have time, right? Successive days. So say we have an intervention, two week homework intervention where at baseline we're doing a math intervention. So we, we check their math homework um, and they're getting these number of responses correct without doing the intervention. Then we introduce that math intervention and progressively they start to increase the number of homework problems that get correct. And then once we remove that intervention again, then they begin to decrease in the number of responses they get correct for homework. Right. So again, we start to see that there might be um, some effect that's happening with the treatment. However, we talked about before one of the weaknesses of this, there might be some other events or extraneous variables affecting the treatment or during the treatment that might also account for why the number of homework, uh, correct homework problems uh, is being done, right? So we have to be mindful of that um, as we um, begin to, again, introduce the treatment and then remove it from the participants, okay? One of the second things that we do is we, we talk about multi multiple baseline design. And so this happens when we're using several participants, maybe three or four participants at the same time, and observing their behavior before and after manipulation under multiple circumstances. So what happens is, you know, maybe I have a, a kid in a private school or a kid in a public school. Um, I have a, a kid that's homeschooled, and I'm trying to introduce a particular um, treatment to those individual, individual students in those different settings, right? So I have various ways I can do that. Right. I can do it from across different individuals. I can do it with different behaviors. Okay. Or I can do it, do it again with different settings. And that, you know, in this case, I was talking about homeschool, private school, uh, and then public school. Those are different settings. Right. We talk about different individuals. We have man, woman, maybe child, or different ethnicities. Right. And so we're looking at different behaviors in different places. You can do it in different behaviors. Right. You could do it as when we're, if we're talking about uh, maybe the gym. 
right? Some individuals do uh, cardio more than they do weightlifting. Some individuals just stretch, right? So those are different behaviors that we can measure over the course of time, okay? So what we do is we check the effectiveness of the treatment and we demonstrate it when the behavior changes only after the manipulation is introduced, right? So we can observe it under multiple conditions or circumstances to rule out the possibility that other events were responsible, right? So say I do a math, that, math, that same math intervention and I have one student who is at home school, one student in private school, and I have another student who is in public school. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have both all of them go through a baseline period, looking at maybe the number of home, number of homework scores they get correct. And then I implement this intervention, two week intervention for those three students. And then I remove that intervention again to see if there is an effect that happens when I introduce that intervention. Right. So now I know. Even with those three students in those three different contexts, I know that the number of correct homework problems did go up in all of the cases and not just in one of the cases. Right. So now I know that the intervention is effective and I can move forward and maybe implement it in a larger scale. All right. So, again, multiple baseline design, this is the idea that the dependent variable changes when the treatment is introduced for one participant, it might be a coincidence, right? So what happens is if it is a coincidence, I know it, if for one participant it might be a coincidence, but if I include three or four individuals at one time, then I know if that treatment affects every individual pretty similarly, maybe an increase in the number of uh, correct homework problems, then I know that the treatment has some effect, right? So it says, if, but if the dependent variable changes, when the treatment is introduced for multiple participants, right, then the treatment is introduced at different times for different participants, and it's extremely unlikely to be a coincidence, right? So maybe I have those three participants, and then I introduce for the first participant after maybe the baseline, I introduce them at, you know, week three, and then I have that intervention for two weeks, and then maybe at week one, I introduce the public school student, and right away for that intervention. And I see it, I see an uptick in the number of homework problems. And then for the private school student, I introduce him maybe six weeks out. And then I see a, another uptick in the number of homework problems if they answer correctly. Right. So at three different periods of time for three different individuals, I see an uptick, right, in the number of homework problems being uh, answered correctly. Right. That means there is no coincidence there. Every incidence where I introduce the treatment, the number of homework problems increase meaning there was an effect, okay? Here's an example, right? This one is referring to the number of cigarettes, right? Smoke, succession program, right? So you got the, the first individual up top, you got three individuals, three subjects. Subject one up top, subject two in the middle, and then subject three um, at the bottom there, right? So what happens is they measure them on baseline, right? So number of cigarettes smoking is really, really close to 300 there for, for most, of, most of them. Right. And then you measure them for the first subject at what is that uh, week? Week three and a half, you introduce the treatment. OK. Automatically, you see a reduction in the number of cigarettes that they smoke, almost close to zero. Right. You wait about another three weeks and then at week six and a half for the, the second participant. Then you introduce the treatment and you see a similar effect. Right. Where they are reducing the number of cigarettes that they smoke. And then the last participant, you wait till week nine and a half, so another three weeks. And then you see a similar trend where they're reducing the number of cigarettes smoked, right? So again, again, across three participants and across three different times, I see a similar trend. I see a similar effect. And I see that, again, this has to be a true effect. I mean, there's not any such thing as a coincidence here because each time for three separate individuals, I see a similar effect. Okay. So with a single case design, these again, these are all single case designs We're using a very, very small number of participants or one participant. The procedure used with a single subject can be replicated with others. Right. So if I'm using one individual, uh, maybe I'm doing a succession plan. And I want him to you know, re reduce the number of cigarettes they smoke. I introduce him to that intervention and then 
I produce that treatment effect, right? And then I add another person, right? Or I do what we call a, I aggregate all these single case studies and I see if that intervention, again, with the aggregate numbers, if I, if I see that same reduction in the number of cigarettes smoked, right? So again, when we're using the single case design, we report on the results for multiple subjects and we show that each subject had a reduction in the number of cigarettes they smoked, right? So we want to see that the same trend of subject to subject. Not every, it's not all subjects are going to have to respond the same to the treatment, but on average, we should see um, the same kind of response, okay? Um, when you are doing this uh, statistical analysis for this type of study, there is a, what we call a com really complex statistical analysis. Again, not really required for single case designs, right? Very, very, all you do is aggregate the single case designs. Again, not really, not really all that, not complex, right? We don't have to worry about um, correcting for anything. We're just going to aggregate all those cases together and then make sure that, again, we see the trend happening um, over and over again, okay? Uh, it says traditional single case research presents results from each subject individually to avoid masking differences between the participants. So what we do is we, we just show each individual participant and the effect that this treatment had each time it was introduced. And again, when you show that, you can show the trend is, uh, is the same for each individual. It might differ for some, but we know that again, if I aggregate them together, I see the same trend uh, for each participant. Okay. Okay, so now we talk about quasi-experimental designs. We talked about true experimental designs, and we remember uh, at the beginning, I think it was experimental designs, I think it's chapter eight, chapter nine, um, there were um, random assignments. We were able to randomly assign participants to particular groups, right? But with a quasi-experimental design, the control is very, very different. So we don't have control over assigning participants to a particular group. Oftentimes, when we're using a quasi-experimental de design, maybe the participants already participated in some, some intervention, and maybe some other participants did not for various reasons, right? And so then we look at those who did participate versus those who did not in a particular, maybe, maybe it's a math intervention, right? But there are some characteristics that might be similar and some characteristics that might be different. Those who participated in the intervention might be really, really high smokers. Um, those who don't participate in the, may not may not feel like they have a problem and, and don't want to participate, right? They don't have the motivation. So maybe the difference in motivation might be the difference between those two groups. But again, they self-selected themselves and we just use a, a natural control group, experimental group um, to, to start to evaluate independent and independent variable, okay? But again, the, the design for quasi-experimental it approximates the control features of a true experiment, and you infer that a given treatment did have an input effect, right? So even though we're not doing a true uh, experimental design, we still can see an effect, um, and maybe see some causal inference. Might be a little more difficult, but we can see some causal inference in the dependent variable and the independent variable. Okay. Quasi-experimentals, number three on the bullet here, says quasi-experiments are often used in applied settings, right? When an IV is manipulated in an actual setting, right? So school, business, hospitals, um, or even in an entire states and cities, right? So people kind of self-select themselves into a particular setting. So for my, my uh, dissertation, I had students who applied to um, a early learning center, right? It was a... Um, it wasn't a private school, but it was a really, a really intensive intervention for uh, early childhood education students, right? So those who applied, they met some and some certain criteria. Those who didn't get into the group were considered considered to be the control group. They didn't make it for various reasons, right? So automatically, you see a difference in those who were selected to be a part of the group versus those who didn't, because those who did get selected met a certain criteria, right? So they became the treatment group, and then the control group. Again, very different characteristics. Maybe they had made a higher income. Maybe their parents were a little more educated. Uh, maybe you know they uh, they had you know just very different characteristics, 
Okay. And so that kind of created that difference in the control and um, the experimental group. Okay. So here are some differences, um, some common differences between the true and the quasi experimental design. So with a true experiment, when we're talking about the assignment for the treatment, the researcher randomly assigns subjects to control and to the treatment. However, on the flip side, some other non-random method is used to assign subjects to groups. So again, for my dissertation, the school, they selected individuals to be a part of the uh, Disability Learning Center versus uh, being randomly assigned, right? In that case, they were looking at the individuals who were mo most at risk, and they put in place those individuals into um, the Early Learning Center versus those who maybe weren't as at risk and they weren't selected, okay? Um, for the second one, it says control over treatment. The researcher usually designs the treatment, right? So we control the treatment. We, we make sure we have we, who we want to be assigned, randomly assigned to the control and treatment group, and we design the treatment itself. However, with when we talk about control over the treatment with the quasi experimental design, we don't usually control or have any control over the treatment. Um, so what I'm going to do this summer, um, I have a uh, one of my friends, she, she's the executive director of a, a nonprofit, and they do a summer program for young people. Um, so they're going to have 32 young people ranging from kindergarten to, to fifth grade. And I wanted, to, I wanted to help her to evaluate the impact of her program, right? She designed the program. The only thing that I'm going to be doing is going doing a pretest before they start the program. They're going to have the program for about two months. And then after the program, I'm going to assess them on those same measures to see if there was any difference in maybe confidence, self-esteem, um, self-efficacy, right? And some of those measures to see if there was an impact that the treatment and the treatment in this particular case is the uh, summer program had on those participants, those 30 participants, okay? The last thing is use of control groups, okay? So with a quasi-experimental design, control groups are not required, right? I don't really need a control group in this particular case. I'm just looking at pre and post test of those same 32 students, right? With a, a true experimental design, it requires that you use a control and a treatment group because you are you you, you created the treatment, so you need to know that you have your treatment, those who are going through the treatment, and you need to, you need to compare that treatment for those who participated in the treatment to a group that did not, right? So you have to be mindful of Again, making that random assignment and again, aligning those individuals into control group and those individuals into the treatment group. Okay. All right. So the first quasi experimental design is called a one group post test only design. So this design is used to assess the independent variable and how that independent variable. Uh, affects the dependent variable, right? There's no pretest or post-test, right? This test right here usually, or designs, excuse me, uh, it's kind of a, it's really poor design, right? Because there's no internal validity. I don't know the cause or the effect, right? So there's no causal inference for this particular design, okay? I don't know what, what changes. There might be some other factors that are influencing um, the dependent variable, okay? It lacks control or comparison, or comparison group, Right. So with lacking that control, I can't say that one thing caused the other. Right? So what happens is all you do is you have to sort the comparison and interpret the results. Right. So what happens is you have a, you have a participants. Right. In this particular experiment, they the independent variable was sitting next to a stranger. Right. So you're out in a public place. You have someone who is a confederate and they are part of the study. They go sit next to somebody in the mall. And they time the individual to see if the stranger leaves at a particular time, right? Maybe the stranger leaves as soon as the person sits down. Maybe that's one second. Maybe they they, they allow themselves to be that. Maybe, maybe the, the stranger doesn't leave for another five minutes, right? But you're timing each individual trial. You're timing to see if that person gets up or leaves at a certain time. Okay. So again, there's no pretest, there's no post test, and you don't know why that person left. There could be a number of reasons why that person left. Um, sitting next to a stranger, the, the Confederate, they might smell a different way. Um, they, they might, you know, it's just that the person themselves have certain characteristics, right? So you just don't know um, 
about what's causing the, the, them to leave. Okay. The other design that is a little more, um, it's a little more robust and it gives you some cause and effect is the one group pre-test, post-test design. Okay, so what you do is you obtain a comparison group um, by measuring participants before and after the manipulation. Right, so that comparison is again that pretest. So I'm measuring um, before my training program. Here's a, the example down here. Right, so the dependent variable is smoking smoking measure. Right, number of cigarettes per day. Then you do the training program for a specified amount of time, and then after that training program ends, you assess them on the dependent variable again as a post test. And you're looking at the number of cigarettes that are they're, they're smoking. Right? So what this what this does is you're able to kind of see a before and after to see if there's an effect. However, there may be some alternative explanations, right, that are some threats to internal validity. Right. So I may not be able to solely say that the training program made a difference. There may be um, maybe persons in the groups, maybe somebody had a death in the family. Um, or maybe a famous person died from lung cancer, right, during the training program. Or, or maybe, um, you know, they were doing some other program in conjunction to the training program for, for smoking, right? There are a lot of different areas and other extraneous variables that may impact the, the measure for smoking, right? Or maybe when they took the post-test, maybe they just, they were ill that day and, didn't, and didn't, they weren't smoking that many cigarettes because they, they had the flu or maybe they had a science infection, right? So there are other variables that might threaten um, the causal relationship. Some other things that might happen, right? History, maturation, testing, um, instrument decay, and what we call a regression toward the mean, right? So what happens is with history, we'll talk about them individually, but with history, you know, you take the pretest, right? You automatically, you know, over the course of time, you might just um, see things happening in your environment. Maybe you see a commercial that kind of, you know, speaks against smoking and you see the effects, the bad effects of, of um, you know, smoking on the lungs. And you're like, man, you know what, let me put, let me put, this, let me put smoking down for a little bit, right? Or maturation, just over time, um, you, you develop just different tastes. You don't want to smoke anymore. Maybe in your teenage years, you smoked a whole lot. Um, and as you begin to mature, you just, you know, you're not smoking anymore. The testing, the measurement tool, right? Maybe in the first example, you're asking them to measure number of cigarettes per day, right? And then in the second, the post-test, maybe you, you you forgot that you said measurement per, per day, maybe you're doing it per week. So that might mess up um, the level of, again, the testing, right? Instrument decay, right? And again, that, that was instrument decay. Testing, they know that you're going to be testing them on a post-test, so they're probably not going to Again, they want again. We talk about um, social being being desirable, being socially desirable, right? I know smoking is bad; it's frowned upon. So I'm already gonna, you know, maybe I I will uh, I say I'm smoking a whole lot of cigarettes in the first pre-test, but in the second post-test, I, I want to, I want the researchers to know that I really worked on this program. So I say I wasn't smoking anything, right? So I wasn't all that that truthful. And then the last one is regression toward the mean. And so this means, you know, at the beginning, if you're a really, really big smoker, right? You're smoking 300 cigarettes per day, right? The average number of cigarettes smoked per day probably is around 200, maybe, right? And so you are an extreme smoker. And then eventually by the post-test, you're kind of regressing back towards kind of the mean, right? So you smoke maybe really, really high that day. And then your average number of cigarettes is probably around 250, 225. And so you regress back towards the mean based on stuff that happens in your life. Maybe on that day you were tested for smoking. You know, maybe it was a really, really stressful day. Maybe your, your car broke down and, you know, you just were smoking, right? And then on the post test, maybe you just had a birthday. And so you feel really, really good. You're really joyful. And so you're not smoking like that much that day. You're not really all that stressed. So again, all those things play into account. All of these problems we're talking about. History, maturation, testing, instrument decay, regression toward the mean, all of these problems that we just mentioned um, can be eliminated by the use of an appropriate control group, right? So just having someone who, uh, a second group of participants who goes through, you do the pretest, 
they don't do the independent variable. They don't have the training program, and they do a post test to see if there's any difference. And we'll talk about that in the next study or next design. Okay. Here are those threats um, to internal validity that I mentioned. Okay. History. Uh, again, any outside event that could be responsible for the results. Again, maybe you you saw a really prominent actor that was one of your favorite actors who died from lung cancer. So now you stop smoking because of that. Um, maturation. Actually, you change with individual responsibilities that you have. Just change over the course of time. You're, you're maturing as a person, right? Testing effect. So simply taking the pretest changes your behavior. You know that you're going to be tested again. So maybe you you indicate that you smoked a whole lot um, on the pretest. And on the post-test, you don't because you already know that test. Instrument decay, um, just change in the measuring instrument, um, including the observers, again, responsible for uh, changing some of the results. And then lastly, again, we talk about regression toward the mean. Uh, this is the principle that extreme scores on a variable tend to be closer to the mean when a second measure is made. So again, like I talked about on day one at the pretest, you had a very stressful day. So you smoked about 300 cigarettes that day. But, you know, on the post-test, you know, on, on a normal day, the way you normally feel, not, a, not really all that stressed, you smoked about 200 cigarettes that day. So you see a reduction just based on um, the regression back towards the mean number of cigarettes that you smoke. Okay. So again, we talked about eliminating uh, those threats to internal validity that cause and effect, right? So we have non-equivalent control group design, this compares an experimental group with a separate control group, but the two groups are not equivalent. Obviously, when we're talking about smoking, um, anyone that's wanting to participate in a smoking program, they likely have the motivation to stop smoking, right? Participants who don't participate in that smoking program, even though they're smokers, they don't have the motivation yet. They have to make a decision. And so when you have these two separate groups, they may have some different characteristics that define them, right? So motivation may be one, especially for the group that decides they want to participate in that training program, right? But that motivation plays a big role in um, the number of cigarettes, right? So again, the pre-existing difference become a confounding variable, right? And again, when we talk about selection differences or selection bias, again, that motivation is that bias because those two groups are different based on a couple characteristics that really probably matter um, when we're talking about smoking or any other uh, any other group. Okay. Um, you have a non-equivalent control group pretest post-test design. Again, this one is very very similar, right? Because um, you can look at the dependent variable to see if the groups are similar or not, right? If the pretest um, dependent variable say this is smoking, um, you do uh, how many cigarettes smokers uh, smokers are smoking, right? The pretest, maybe the, those individuals who are in the in experimental group, maybe they are smoking 275 cigarettes per day in the pretest, right? And in the non-control group, uh, excuse me, the no, no treatment control group, maybe they are smoking 325, right? So we see a difference there already, right? So we know that there's already a difference between those two groups, but we can see that if they don't get any treatment for the control group, that their numbers remain the same, right? And the participants who participated in the treatment group, we see that after the treatment, their post-test numbers dipped way into the 200, right? Low 200. So now we see that there are some, some treatment effects there, right? Those who didn't participate in the treatment group or in the treatment, their numbers remain the same. Those who did, we saw a reduction. And so we're able to see a cause and effect based on um, those two groups, okay? It says, uh, this bullet here, it says the pretest shows how similar the groups were before the manipulation, and the post-test shows the groups experienced similar effects despite their dissimilarities, right? So again, we saw that in the, the treatment group, there was a reduction in the number of cigarette smokes. In the control group, there was no difference whatsoever. So we see that there was an effect with that treatment. Okay. Uh, here's an example uh, of a, an example of the non-experimental pre-test, post-test design, okay? So what happens with this one, says the National Alcohol Screening Day is a community-based program that provides free access to 
alcohol screening, uh, a private meeting with a health professional to review results and education materials, et cetera. So when you go through this program, after you are assessed, they give you this alcohol screening, they give you a private meeting with a health professional to review the results of that screening, and then they provide you with education materials and maybe some other, um, maybe one-on-one -on -one group settings and group, group work to help you reduce um, your alcohol consumption. So, so for an evaluation, this is what a recent group of researchers did. They used the National Alcohol Screening Day participants or attendees in five community locations. Each of those, loca each of those attendees completed the baseline measure of their recent alcohol consumption. Everybody did. A control group, then the control group formed a week following the NSA, uh, the NASD at the same location using displays, inviting participants to take a health survey. So all the control group did was they participated in a health survey, right, to determine what their health level was. The experimental group or the treatment group, they went through um, the private screening um, they reviewed the results, they did the education materials, maybe they had some other uh, interventions that were offered during that time. And then both the treatment and the control groups took a post-test three months later. What they discovered was participants who were identified as at risk and based on that pre-test, or they were identified as, as at risk, the results showed that the treatment group participants showed a significant reduction in alcohol consumption. So what they did was they looked at all the high risk or at risk drinkers, right, based on their pre test uh, alcohol screening. And then they used those individuals to compare the treatment group and the control group to see if there was any reduction in alcohol consumption. And if it did show, um, there was a significant difference um, in that reduction in alcohol consumption. Okay. So, what happens if you want to mimic something that is Kind of similar to a um, experimental design and this is what i did when i was working on my dissertation so because i knew that there were um, some differences in the criteria for selecting students to be, be a part of the early learning center versus those who were not selected to be a part of it then i knew that they did have some similarities right they did have some similarities and so what i did was i did what we call a propensity score match right and i had nine equivalent groups but I made them as similar as possible by comparing, by matching one group, one person, or one student from the early learning group versus one student from the non-learning group on various characteristics, right? And so with them non, not being non-equivalent, I was able to match them on very similar characteristics and I had one-to-one -one matching, right? So one group, so maybe it was a black child whose mother was, uh, you know, a high school dropout, um, and they were able to be selected, but then I had another black child whose mother was a high school dropout in the non experimental treatment group. And so I paired those two together, and I did that for, I think it was 275 students. I matched all those students together, and I was able to see that there were some differences between the experimental group or treatment group, those, those students that attended the early learning center, versus those students who did not. Okay. So that is propensity score matching. The other experimental design is what we call an interrupted time series design and a control series design. And these are usually done with larger numbers of people, okay? An interrupted time series design, they examine a dependent variable over an extended period of time before and after a variable is implemented. So what happens oftentimes, especially in, especially in cities, right? Maybe there is a, a speed. So maybe there's a street and the average speed on that street is extremely, extremely high, right? So what they do is they implement maybe some structural difference. Maybe they put a speed bump. Maybe they uh, they, they put some other uh, types of structures around the street to, to again, to influence the slowing of, of the traffic. And so what they do is they measure before the speed, right? Before. Then they implement the structures in the street. And then after a certain point, they start to see a reduction in the speed or average speed on that particular street. Or just like on, on campus, right? Before we had those radars, right? Those, those stationary radar detectors, right? For speed. Before they put them up, maybe people were going 25, 30 miles per hour, right? But by putting those, those little radars up, 
they're able to slow traffic down based on, you know, the average average speed after they put those things up. And now they're seeing a reduction in the speed. And that happens, right? So interrupt time series design, they look at it before, before they implemented the whatever it was, and then they look at the after to see if there's any difference. Okay. <laughs> this is very vulnerable to interpretation problems because again, this could be a possible regression to the mean where they were traveling at high speeds before, but maybe it was a rush hour, or maybe it was, uh, you know, a different, maybe it was a festival that people were trying to get to, right? People were just speeding, 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 speeding. And then after that, people started slowing down as maybe the event um, began to join the delay, right? Then you have what we call a control series design, okay? This is an extension of the interrupted time series design in which there is a comparison or a control group, and we'll talk about what that control group looks like, right? But what happens is you involve find you involve findings of similar populations that did not re receive the manipulation being studied. So, if I'm looking at universities, I'm looking at universities similar to the size of, Al of Alabama A and M, or maybe UAH or uh, UNA or some other universities, Alabama Alabama State, maybe we have some similar universities, size of universities, and what we do is we're looking at the average speed that students or faculty or staff drive on campus, right? So now I'm comparing my uh, average speeds to the speeds of, you know, UNA, UAH, and Alabama State. And what I did was I implemented, I implemented those radars on campus, but the other, the other campuses did not, right? And so I want to see if that had any difference in the average speed of the, the cars on my campus to the other cars on the other campuses. And I'm hoping that just by implementing that radar on campus for the speed, that it reduces the speed on campus, okay? So that is how we compare the similar population, similar schools, to see if the manipulation of, again, just by implementing that one particular variable has an effect on speed. So here's an example of an interrupted time series design. So here's a specific, here's a specific example. Okay. So Connecticut traffic fatalities. So during the 1950s, 1940s, there was an influx in the number of traffic fatalities in Connecticut. So what um, the Connecticut legislation did, they created a lot of laws. They they made some changes to uh, the roadways and what they wanted to see was during that time was there a reduction in the number of traffic fatalities or the number, number of fatalities right so what they saw was an increase right there there was some variability right in 1951 to 52 53 there's some variability there and there was an influx in the number of fatalities in 1955 and then when they made those when they made that treatment the uh, they reduced the, the number of, uh, they maybe they increased the, the police presence. They, they created some legislation to uh, improve the streets and roads. Then they began to see a reduction in the number of traffic fatalities. And that continued to drop even into 1959. There's a continuous trend of reduction in 1959, right? So that is what we call the interrupted time series design. You have kind of a baseline before the treatment, then you implement some type of variable, legislation, uh, some type of treatment, and then you see uh, an effect because of that treatment, right? But with that, there could be some other extraneous variables because we don't know that it was just the legislation. We don't know if it was just the increasing of the police presence. We don't know those things, right? There might be some other factors, but what we can do is that when we want to do something else, we want to compare to some of the populations, then we can start to see that the traffic fatality rate actually had a difference, right? So the control series design compares Connecticut fatality traffic fatality rate to other cities, right? So they used very, very similar cities to, to them, right? To their, their to their city, right? So four comparable states, they aggregated all their fatalities, right? So in the in this chart here, we see Connecticut fat, fat, fatality rate, that's a solid blue line, right? And the fatality rate of the comparable four, stated, four states are the dotted line, right? So 
Connecticut already had, you know, a reduction rate or, or, or a, a lower rate of fatality rate than the other states did, right? But at that time, right, when they did the treatment in 1955, again, that fatality rate increased. As soon as from 1955 to 1956, when they increased or introduced that legislation and increased their police presence, you start to see a reduction in the number of the fatality rate. And that gap is widening. So in 1951, um, the gap fatality rate was very, very similar to that of the comparable states. But when we talk about 1959, after uh, that legislation was introduced, then you see a larger gap. That's about what? Nine, eight, or nine and a half, nine, about almost 10, to about 13, so about, you know, four point difference, right? We see that four point difference and we can, we can make a decision now that that legislation increasing the police presence had a, a, a huge difference, a significant reduction in the fatality rate. Okay, the last few um, research designs or developmental research designs, what we want to see with developmental research designs is how do people develop or change over time? Okay, so that's why individuals do what we call developmental psychologists are looking, uh, if anybody remembers, when we're looking at personality, right? So personality, um, they, they used to say that personality was kind of set um, at the age of five. Right. But now other researchers are showing that uh, Lev Vygotsky says that when after five, you continue to evolve over time. But how did he know that? Right. He was able to follow people from, you know, from early adolescence to adolescence to teenage to adult years to see if there was a difference and change in personality. Right. So, again, over the course of time, these three methods, again, are observing the changes in people as they age. And that's the biggest thing with developmental psychology is looking at people as they age. Okay. Cross-sectional method, right? We're looking at persons of different ages uh, measured at the same point in time. So individuals born in 1965, individuals born in 1960, uh, early, individuals born in 1965, 75, 80. And maybe we're, we're measuring them on um, computer literacy, right? Measuring them on computer literacy. You see them at, at one point in time. And we see, we might see that those who are born later have higher computer literacy than those who were born a little earlier. A longitudinal method, you're going to be following that same group of people. And it's, you're observing them from different points in time as they grow older. So maybe I follow uh, those, those young people that were born uh, in, in the 1980s. And I'm following them, a cohort of them from, from birth all the way up through adulthood to see if some of their life changes had any impact on their life outcomes, right? And then the second one, or the third one, excuse me, is a combination of the longitudinal and the cross-sectional methods. And again, it's a combination of those two methods, and we'll show an example of both of those for all three of these, okay? So here is the example, right? So for the cross-sectional method, you got your year of birth, your cohort, right? 1955, 1950, 1945, so at different times, Right, or different ages, different age groups, group one, group two, group three, and then you again assess them at one point in time. Right. Then you have a longitudinal method. This is the first cohort is born in 1955. It's only one group, and you follow them 19, from 55 years old at time one, five years later at 60, and five years later at 65. Right. And then again, here is a sequential method. This is one of the most robust. You follow two groups. Right. A cohort born in 1955, cohort born in 1945, and you're following them, right? 10 years, right? 55 years old, 10 years, 60, or five years, excuse me, five years, 65, same thing for group two. Every five years, you're going to assess them on a particular measure to see how they're progressing and aging um, effectively. Okay. So here's one of the Disadvantages right, to cross-sectional data. Right? They are relatively inexpensive. Cross-sectional data is relatively inexpensive, and it does allow for comparison to be made really, really quickly. But there are two things that may affect um, the results and how you can interpret the results. Okay. So again, researchers can only infer that any differences found are due to age. Right? 
But differences may actually be due to just the cohort effects, right? So a cohort, you know, how we define a cohort is a group of people born at a or at about the same time and exposed to the same societal events. So that's why we call, you know, baby boomers, uh, Gen Z, um, you got the golden age, you got, you know, Gen Xers, right? So everybody that's in these different generations are considered a cohort, born around the same time, again, experiencing the same societal events. So, you know, uh, you all did not experience, many of you didn't experience the, um, the terrorist assassin in 2001, right? But I did. Many of you grew up, you know, in the early, in the early 2000s. I grew up in the 90s, right? So again, even in that, we experienced very different social societal events, okay? Cohort effect happens when the differences among age groups is attributed to what we call social, cultural, economic, or political differences rather than to the effective age, right? So when we have cohort effects, the way you think about life it's going to be very different than I think about life because of, again, culture, um, how I was raised socially, um, even the political differences that we have, right? So, again, in those cohort effects, they can affect um, how we are able to infer and make inferences to different populations of people. So the differences that we do see, right, so if we're looking at information literacy or computer literacy at each cohort from, you know, millennials to Gen Z, Right to baby boomers, we're going to see very different levels of computer literacy based on each cohort. Because when we're talking about cell phones, I I got a cell phone when I was around fourteen. Right, you all got cell phones probably a little younger. Um, social media was as you grew up on social media and internet. I only had internet maybe towards the end of middle school. Right, beginning of middle school, end of middle school. Right, so again, all those different. Behaviors that we and I exhibit are going to be different than the behaviors you exhibit, and the way you think is going to be very different than the way I think most times, okay? based on just those cohort effects. Okay? When we're talking about longitudinal measures, again, this is the only way to conclusively study changes in people as they age, right? because now you're following a group of people kind of specifically and showing over the course of time how they grow, how they mature how they change, how they transform. Right? It is extremely expensive and very difficult to carry out because it takes a long time to yield results. Right? So if I gave, um, so if I had some students that participated in the Early Learning Center um, back in the 90s, right, and I want to see um, how well they're doing in their life outcomes now, maybe with family, income, education, I would have to follow them for 30 years right, to see how they're doing. But over the course of the time, a lot of things could happen. Individuals could pass away. Individuals, I could lose the contact from them or with them because maybe they changed their number. Uh, maybe they, they moved away to another state or another city or another country. And so there's a lot of attrition that happens when I have a cohort um, that I have to follow from, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. It makes it very, very difficult to carry out. Okay. Um, the sequential method, method takes less time and effort than the longitudinal method, but because you are combining those two, um, you're not going to be able to yield some of the results right away. You will be able to see kind of at points in time, but you're not going to be able to yield those same results as if you were doing a longitudinal study. Okay. And then the last point down here says it does not provide information as complete as a longitudinal study can offer. Right. So again, when you're doing the sequential method, again, you are combining the cohort and the longitudinal together, or that cross-sectional and the longitudinal together, but again, you are, um, you're, you're missing some information because you're not gonna be able to follow maybe all those groups, um, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road. Okay, so that is it um, for chapter 11. Um, here are some of the research questions. Um, as we move forward, um, just again, make sure that you are Taking, taking a look at these review, re, review questions, make sure that you can answer them. This is kind of the sort of, um, kind of like your study guide. If you can answer these review questions um, and, and know them really well, then by the time the test comes, you should be fine. Um, but again, chapter 11, single case, quasi-experimental and developmental research. Again, these are just ways outside of experimental design 
that you can use. Um, you can still use similar designs, but you don't have control over a random assignment and you're having to use uh, the participants that you have there and, and use them and their characteristics to make sure that you can. And the way you design it is going to give you the information that you want. So when you're going about your methods section um, for your, your proposal, you want to look at your research question, you want to determine what your independent variable is, what your dependent variable is, and how you're going to design it. Are you going to do random assignment? Are you going to use convenient sampling? Um, are you going to use a group of students that are already present and maybe just look at individuals who participated in the program versus a, a group that did not? How are you going to design um, your, pro your project? Right? How are you going to design your experiment to make sure that you're getting the information that you want to answer for that research question? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video here, but I uh, hope you all have a great weekend. Um, I will see you all next week. Uh, be, look, be on the lookout for me uploading this really, really soon. Um, again, by the, by the next 15, 10 minutes, you should see it um, around 4, 4, 4, 15. All right, we'll talk to you later. Have a good one.